um, very, very close to our hearts at the moment. We're all dealing with issues in COVID. We're all dealing with this personally and we're all dealing with this um, in our companies that we work in. Um, and I, I enjoyed putting this, this together, especially for you. And there's a new model in here uh, based on some earlier research that we've done. So we're going to do this in the first 40 minutes. Uh, as you see, I have an MBA. Uh, for me, it was absolutely life changing. Um, any master's degree, uh, any, any future master's degree can build on your career. But for me, the MBA, having been a very, very busy uh, senior um, person in the civil service, um, it, it was a huge, huge change for me and made me think about everything very differently in business. Uh, I've got a PG Cert HE, that means it's a master's in, in teaching as well, and all staff in Birmingham have that. So you're trained not only in your business knowledge, but also in your teaching and learning knowledge, which is very important. And I'm a fellow of the Higher Education Academy. Okay, so if we'd like to move on, Cherry. Cherry is seeing my mouse today, clicking me forward. Next slide, Cherry. Thank you. So this afternoon, or more like this evening, uh, first of all, going to have my masterclass uh, for the first 40 minutes. Um, if we can flick back a minute. Cherry, flick back a minute, please. Thank you. Uh, we'll have a programme overview, MBA and MSc programmes uh, for SIM. Uh, then we'll have Q&A. And if I don't talk too long, uh, we may have time at the end of the masterclass for any questions. Please keep on mute. And if you have any questions, please submit them in the chat box. And that's very kindly organized by everyone at uh, SIM. Oh, next slide, please. This is great. So here we are. This is me. Um, over 13 years in business operations experience and civil servant. Yeah, so very familiar with the things that most of you will come across. Project management, change management particularly, especially in times like these, we've been through this before with, with huge cuts perhaps in organisations and managing that. And I've been there, done that and got the t-shirt. Um, also uh, working in stakeholder management, so working with uh, local communities, working with uh, tiers, um, working with um, what we have, the LHS, those sort of trusts as well, to deliver across regions in the Department of Work and Pensions. Um, also, strategic marketing was something I took on later on as part of, of my role. Um, so, from doing an MBA, which was sponsored by the Department of Work and Pensions, um, I then decided after doing my dissertation, it was so exciting, it completely, as I said earlier, was life changing. I gave my dissertation to, to my work, which was eliminating child poverty. That was our agenda at the time, and how and why it was. And so that was really interesting and um, found it was, did surprisingly well. Um, and that, that, that was a new surprise to me as well. And uh, then I saw an opportunity to do uh, a PhD with an SME, uh, quite close to where I live, which is actually in North Wales at uh, Bangor University. And uh, it, this was funded by European funding. And so a very big change in career. Uh, and this has spawned a lot of research for me and, and I'm very proud about it as all of our lecturers and professors are. Some of the things I'm talking about uh, today, which I touch upon will be the research I do now. So Cherry's going to show us quantum sensors. If you could collect, you could uh, show me the uh, link for quantum sensing. Here we go. So as well as teaching, a lot of us, uh, most of us in fact, do are very active in research. So a couple of years ago, I started working with um, our physics department and they have a huge quantum sensing technology hub and that leads several universities. So you can see from here, these are the areas that I'm working with, with them. And I'm very proud to say that I'm the lead for the school doing this and I'm the only one they invited on there. And one of the reasons for that is because I actually work, have experience, if you like, as a consultant. 
So once you start doing something like an MBA, it allows you to be able to be a consultant, to do research, but also to advise companies on what they can be doing. So what I'm looking at here is looking at uh, developing supply chains uh, for very, very innovative products. So in this, in this case, I'm looking at cold atom sensing technology. So we have um, a huge grant over five years that I'm, I'm working with uh, this marvellous group of scientists and you can see all the, the areas here that we that we're looking at. Okay, so Cherry if we could go back to the slides. Okay, and then on a different note, I'm also looking at digital marketing and tourism uh, and how uh, important now how um, loan entrepreneurs of so small companies that aren't digitally competent. How do they manage to learn digital? It's really important for them to know their research on investment, their time uh, that they're taking to do on this, and uh, they, they need to know all about this, and their return on investment is very important too. So we were looking at a big project, project over five years, two projects in fact, and uh, analysing the data on this, and this is how people acquire knowledge and how they work together, and that's actually very useful for, for, for teaching for us as well, how we learn in groups. Uh, Okay, if we could have the next slide, please. Okay, so I can see we've more people joining us. Um, I'm going to move on now. I've talked about myself, and I've talked about uh, the passion that we have at Birmingham for for research and for high quality teaching. Okay. Um, so today I'm talking about disaster recovery responses, a business perspective. So the question I thought I'd posit today is. How do firm behaviours constrain or enhance firm survival and growth? And how do organisations recover from environmental disaster and hence economic crisis? OK, so that's a very big question. And I don't have all the answers, but I have some inquiries and some early thoughts. So if we could have the next slide, please. So in today's masterclass, we'll be looking at three aspects firm orientation measures and frameworks as they relate to growth. Ecosystems and the impact of the environmental disaster on organisations. I think what's really interesting about what we're going through at this time all over the globe is actually looking at our ecosystems that in which our operate. And it's one of the nice things if you're doing future studies, whether you're doing a master's or master's in international business, or you're doing an MBA, is having the time to actually look outside what it is you're doing in your current role. That's very important. And if you're a full-time student, it's taking that time out to see the broader horizon. That's a great opportunity to, to you to develop your career, but also to, to, to learn so much more. Okay, so the third, the third point is disaster and crisis studies literature. So we'll be touching upon that uh, and looking at new insights on business recovery research, which I know has been lacking. Could I have the next slide, please? So firm orientation measures and frameworks as they relate to firm growth. That was the first point. So what is firm orientation? So from my PhD studies, uh, over the first few years of looking at this research from 2005 onwards after my MBA, I was interested in finding out what the company was doing that I was working with, being a high tech company. Um, my project was pre-written because it had a grant attached to it, but basically it wasn't relevant to what was needed. So that I could work with that. And what I wanted to know was how best to grow the company. And what I found out was that small companies companies do not do not do what textbooks generally tell us they do they don't do marketing strategy in a formulaic way they do it in a different way they use entrepreneurial marketing but it took me a year or so to find that out so very 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 high level investigation in literature studies that I had to look at to synthesize the literature so um, firm orientation is a set of behaviors that drive firm growth and this is something really useful for you to know in your organizations Often it's quantitatively measured. So there's a big raft of literature predominantly in the market orientation literature. So Coley and Jaworski, 1990, and Coley et al. 
are a group of researchers that really stimulated this movement. Uh, Narva and Slater is also another, another group of researchers at the same time, uh, same time period that were looking at this. Um, as a student, I looked at this and, I, and working in the company, I thought these questions they're asking don't reflect what they're doing. Um, Knight, Matsuno et al, they were looking at entrepreneurial or orientation. So the, these two platforms of areas, entrepreneurial orientation and orientation, became quite solid and, and well cited. So people were talking about it, people were publishing from these papers and they were known as to be very rigorous and they still are. However, when you take that to your own company, you think, well, does that apply, apply here? And I felt that it didn't. So on my PhD, I, I, I went further in this and looked at it from a qualitative perspective. Okay, so this would really, Give you an opportunity to look at the activities and behaviors around orientation not not high level statistics grinstein in 2008 was interesting because a paper of his um, looked at of these orientations and the interesting thing is if you're in a stable market there is no impact on growth if there is both market and entrepreneurial orientation present if, if the market is difficult and an unstable and challenging, for example, technology markets would be like that quite often because of the high level of radical to market uh, launches, um, or perhaps in this environment where we're looking at the impact of a pandemic, then the combined approach of being focused on customers and competitors and having really good integrated systems plus being very, very entrepreneurially led in small or large companies and seeking opportunities, that is what drives things forward for you. And so that's why it's so interested in this context for recovery. Uh, and I'm very pleased to say that uh, last couple of weeks ago, I was um, awarded a prize, which I'll collect over summer virtually, unfortunately, not in America, uh, for the most influential paper on this for my PhD. Um, it's changed the way we think about how companies behave and how they or orientate themselves. And a lot of researchers are now reading my paper and using that for the basis of their studies. Could we have the next page, please, Cherry? Okay, this is the simplicity of this model, I suppose. Um, these are the four orientations I looked at. And to explain, this was published in 2011, and this is the paper I'm talking about where, where people have picked up on this and thought this is applied in lots of businesses and one of the things you'll do if you're doing an MBA or if you're doing studies on mass management or international business you will familiarize yourself with applying uh, models and theory that you read about and apply it to context and this is what gives you the rich findings okay so here I found in the company I worked in after three or four years of my PhD um, I found that while Coley and Jaborski and authors like that were talking about market orientation, also including customers, I found that if I applied some, some scales like that to a company I worked with, um, it would show incorrect findings. And the reason for this is that, is that I was looking at, particularly the one I was based in as a starting point, um, didn't know much about competitors. So they, they so, well, we have the best product, people will want it, which is kind of naive. But at the time, they were very advanced. But what happens, of course, is that other competitors side and follow you, and suddenly your market becomes saturated. And then you have to be at a point when you know what your com competitors are doing. And that is the point at which they thought, we need somebody to come and do a PhD and look at this area, which was what I was doing. So I argue that in this paper, that we should look at market orientation and customer orientation as completely separate. They overlap, but they're distinct because most smaller companies, generally speaking, are very, very customer focused. They look at the market, not from a segmentation, segmentation uh, large scale approach. They look at this from a bottom up approach, find one customer and then find more of the same that will buy the same product with small adaptations. That tends to be what happens. We call this a bottom-up approach to marketing and Dalgic and Lou talk about this in their paper, if you're interested. Um, can we move to the next slide, please? 
So here is the model with some of the um, aspects. That are. So if you use scales and measures and it's quantitative, you have a research hypothesis and you have constructs that you develop and often they're taking pre-existing scales, which is why Coley and Javorsky, Katsuno, et cetera, are well cited because people will replicate those studies perhaps make some adaptations. So for me, I was started from scratch, if you like, using some of the research that I got from the company uh, and some of the research from theory and putting that together, all this an iterative process of constructing a concept. And so these are the sorts of things that I could see would be taking place in this particular company. And these align also with, with the literature that I've been talking to you about. So I then had to go off and discover about innovation orientation. I found that that was quite new. So there was less work on that and that was much harder to, to find and to, to develop. It's advanced now, of course. But we see, for instance, we see that this is an overarching knowledge infrastructure and this encouraging, stimulating and sustaining innovation. So it's a firm behavior driven by the management and the leadership of companies. Okay. And what I'm arguing in this paper as well is that these aspects overlap uh, and it depends what you're doing as to what your focus would be but in a small company mostly it's uh, implicit it's fast-paced you don't have time to plan perhaps um, but you might focus on one aspect or another so if i if i give a master class to an entrepreneur they may be hugely successful sometimes it's worth stopping to think well what is it i do well and what could I do more of? And sometimes I can unpick that for people. It's really interesting when you do research with people because you often find when you're talking to companies, you'll come back to them a few months later and they've changed something because of the discussion that you've had with them. Could I have the next slide, please? So here we're talking about systems, firm orientations and growth. After my PhD, I was very excited to meet Mary Saranta, Dr. Mary Saranta from uh, University of Vascular, which is also a top 100 university. And it's very closely associated to the University of Berkeley in California. So from, from then on, when we met in about 2009 or 10, we've continued to work together and that's great fun. So what she did, she replicated the study that I'd done in my PhD, which is in Wales in the UK with uh, technology companies, replicated it in Silicon Valley. And it was really interesting what we found out. So some of the key findings we found out in relation to what we're discussing today were things like the different emphasis on orientations. So they're very, very different from, from one country to another, one region to another. Um, we, feel, we think really that's due to the situational ecosystems. So in other words, wherever your, your business is, particularly in small high growth companies, it will be influenced heavily by your marketplace. But I would argue even with large companies, you are also heavily influenced. We can see that to look at some retraction strategies large companies are making perhaps in the UK during the COVID crisis, uh, that, that, that that marketplace uh, impacts on the decision making that they're, they're doing at the time and whether they wish to further invest or retract uh, because of the market facilitated by the choices of the government and the ecosystem. So let's move on, Cherry. Okay, so this is just a slide to show you a simple overview, really. If you look at the uh, UK companies, uh, the firm growth, firm growth for US companies was huge. So over the five, first five years that we were looking at of companies, um, the growth was pretty slow for UK, uh, mostly incremental innovation. Whereas for the US firms, it was very high growth. So a couple of the companies, they had a billion turnover uh, in dollars in the So uh, very, very, very uh, competitive and entrepreneurial. But what was mostly interesting was the value if you were interested in marketing because uh, there are only one or two companies that thought to have a marketing or sales resource in the UK, but in the US it was very prevalent. So they had teams that were, had a really strong uh, software engineering background. So it was engineering straight to sales, direct very linear, not hierarchical, very fast moving. And uh, there were some interesting quotes from people, uh, one of them being that, um, you know, we, we'll sell something before we've made it. Whereas in the UK, there was more reticence and more care 
more wariness of getting it wrong, not wanting to launch a product without it being um, going out there, out of the door, being perfect. But that's very different when you're trying to implement a large software across an organization. Next slide, please. Okay, so these are some of the similarities we found. And this is really relevant because it emphasizes differences in focus of orientations and ecosystems. So similarities, they were very research and development focused. So about 40% of their, of their um, income stream would be spent best back in R&D. Um, a lot of market intelligence generation, which is part of uh, market orientation. Um, but in these types of companies, they don't use formal departments or formula for formal data gathering. It's all via networks, what I would call implicit. So people, contacts that you've developed. And of course, in ecosystems such as Silicon Valley, those contacts are hugely important for doing business and for growing business. And in Singapore, that uh, the contacts are very, very important to you for growing companies. And that's another good thing for joining SIM because, of course, you have the contacts there already and you'll de develop those through your MBA or on your master's programmes if you're doing management or international business. So responsiveness to competitors. Both groups focus up, both groups of uh, samples of companies focus on innovation, but much, much more so in the US. Um, interestingly, an entrepreneurial marketing trait to lead customers, not to follow them. And the reason for this is if you ask somebody like me, and I'll openly admit I'm a slow adopter, I'm not an early adopter, I'm very late. Um, I don't know what's going to be there in five years' time that I need. I didn't know that I'd be relying on, on uh, my laptop like this all the time or, or reliant on my mobile phone and I can't live without it. I don't know the possibilities. And it's the same in these B2B markets that often these Silicon Valley companies operate in. So, so if you ask a customer, you're likely to inhibit what you actually develop. And it may not have a usefulness beyond that one customer. And so, so they tend to, some of the companies actually told me, we actually ignore our customers. I wouldn't recommend that wholeheartedly, but in some cases. Um, now, part of the um, entrepreneurial marketing orientation framework that I developed, I haven't put it on here because that's another framework, but it comes, it flows through from that conceptual model with the very same descriptors on it, except that I included sale, sales and promotion on the final uh, framework. Um, I replaced what they had in the market orientation scales. They talked about interdepartmentalism. And increasingly in very flexible companies and larger entrepreneurial companies, being in departments is not necessarily the best way to work. And so, Having fully integrated business processes is really important. Um, but interestingly, in the US, they rejected that idea and felt that they were more wanting to focus on innovation and product launches rather than the communication within the company as it grew. So that's an interesting one. Networks and relationships are absolutely vital throughout all these types of uh, business that they're doing. And they include partnership as the fifth P, which I thought was good. And I'm sure you've all heard of the four P's. Personal contact networks, so PCNs, partnerships with larger firms for innovation, marketing and business growth are hugely important for B2B channel partners and reselling. Could we flip on to the next slide, please, Cherry? So the differences. Speed to market is something that I really wanted to look at because this, this is part of an entrepreneurial orientation element, if you like, aspect, a construct that's been measured quite often. So how, how quickly and where, where the company places itself. So think about where you're working now and where you think they would be. It's interesting to reflect. So in the US, they took a leadership stance. In some cases, they had their competitors on the wall and they knew exactly how they were going to compete against them. Um, so they took a leadership stance and that's a good thing to do in a saturated market. So if you're already in a saturated market, we call this um, the red ocean, the blooded ocean, if you like, full of competitors. It's actually quite good to, to be successful by not competing. And by not competing, the way to do this sometimes for smaller companies is to go into a blue ocean, move, move, move somewhere else to pivot, which I'll talk about in a minute. 
Um, so being a leader can be more expensive, but, but for these companies, it's, it worked well for them to get, to get products out quickly that were more innovative than their competitors. In the UK, they took a much more collaborative stance. And I think that's partly because they don't have the investment that's available to them in Silicon Valley. And partly they did take risks. I, I would say greater risks in some respects, because in Silicon Valley, you have available to you um, business angels, you have very, very high profile professors on very much higher salaries because education over there is, is privatized and very expensive. Uh, you have resources, great employee resources who are already highly competent. They gravitate to that area for you to work with. Um, so that ecosystem is hugely important. And we see that in other sectors, not just high tech. It could be in agriculture, it could be a food. There are specialist areas, aren't there, in different countries and re regions. So having that to your disposal makes a real difference, doesn't it? Um, for the UK, um, business owners, the directors that, that I talked to, they actually were leveraging money by borrowing for, for, on their house with their family in it. And I actually think that's somewhat more risky than, than what was going on in, in the United States. Um, proactiveness. So the UK was less proactive in terms of sales focus and opportunities. Uh, the U US write this, rate this very highly, totally embedded as, the, uh, as risk as well and individual culture. They, they just accepted that and were used to that, it's the way they operate personally and in their own companies um, and this propensity to part of the innovation orientation function um, totally interested in um, in high speed to market getting products out of the door quick for the UK firms it was more incremental making adjustments and improvements to, to software for companies um, exploiting markets so this is a really good thing to do to, to, to take opportunities uh, in the UK it tended to be niche and quite small reliant on word of mouth this again is actually a theory word of mouth or e-word of mouth is more prevalent now uh, in the US provoking and changing markets and this is the pivoting I was talking about firms pivoting into brand new markets and this is something that you will see companies do now in the climate that we've got um, responsiveness towards customers the UK very customer orientated, as I mentioned earlier, in the US wanting to lead customers. They don't always know what, what they need or what, what is possible. And these are business customers we're talking about. Sales and promotion, again, heavily focused, using teams and networks and also a born global attitude and very easy then to find uh, and, and situate different bases in different parts of the globe. And some of these very small companies are doing that across different continents. Could have the next slide, please. So there's very little research when we look at disaster recovery. And I've been doing some research with uh, Susie Marish, who is in Canterbury University in New Zealand. And we were looking at successful companies who've survived the series of earthquakes that they had. And we've all heard about those and the impact on Christchurch as a community. So we looked at restaurants, which were very interesting to look at because they really were the hub for the community. This was somewhere to, a place to go of safety. Uh, and what we wouldn't do for going into a restaurant now, folks. But um, anyway, it was very, very interesting, very traumatic for my colleague because she lived through this. It was very difficult for her to, to write, uh, but very fascinating and important. Uh, and again, this is taken off as a paper that people are interested in, in, in using and reading, especially now because of COVID. Um, I found, again, were large scale studies reported generally, so not the nuance, or nuances, there was less known about that. And this is why we do this paper to, to, to look at this. Um, can we turn over to the next one, please, Joe? OK, so from that paper, here we are, 2020, post disaster business recovery. Looking at this from the topic that I know well, which is entrepreneurial marketing, this infrastructure in the two which also includes innovation. So having that interaction creates this innovation. So we can see here that in post-disaster post -disaster environments, there was a personal in, in, impact post-quake. So people losing colleagues, losing friends, uh, divorces due to impact of having no money when they've been running the business, the stress of it all. Um, also the fact that they lost employees because when the zone, the red zone they called it, in the middle of Christchurch was closed, then this meant they had to move. 
and then they lost their customers. In some cases, they had to relocate. So that, that impact was immediate. And what I find interesting about the pandemic, and I, and I know that we're exp experiencing in the UK for the first time, and that in Singapore, you're far more experienced about this uh, earlier impacts with SARS, but, but I, it is very, a very severe an impact, I think, compared to some of the crises that we talk about. So we looked at this from an entrepreneurial self-efficacy perspective and from an effectual reasoning perspective. So this, these are theories, if you like, that explain the way entrepreneurs make decisions. And it's interesting to talk about effectual reasoning because effectual reasoning is rather than having a long-term strategy and managerial perspective, this is an entrepreneurial perspective where you're looking at who I know and what I know which works very well in this sort of context for any size of company, I would say. So here you can see the dotted line in the middle box there. The entrepreneur decisions were to resume delay or get out and fail. So quite a few companies did that, but we were interested in those that we could see now that were still operating and actually all of them had grown and expanded and had more than one premises in some cases. Um, so the companies we looked at then that was successful, we then looked at from their interviews what they did next. So they talked about having to relocate because their, their business had gone, it had been destroyed or they had to rebuild it or they were in the red zone and couldn't go back. So we don't have that so much with COVID, but I think we do on a temporary basis. The companies probably do have to relocate. They were looking for financial injection. In New Zealand, the ecosystem there is very good and that includes particularly insurance. For, for such things, which we see does not occur in all countries. And typically we know earthquakes occur in an awful lot of underdeveloped countries who don't have that sort of supportive in, in infrastructure. But the interesting thing is that a lot of them created uh, new businesses, new, new business models out of necessity. So sometimes they'd have a pop-up shop in a big uh, uh, container and make that into a cafe. Sometimes they'd share premises so somebody would be operating a cafe in the morning and perhaps a pub would be operating in the afternoon. Um, they'd be sharing those sorts of premises. And so this, this makes me think very much of, of COVID now and the decision making that needs to take place. And so there you see entrepreneurial marketing behavior. This is what we saw, the theory that explains what they're doing. This is what we saw them do. So research or resource organizing. So rather than what entrepreneurs do, which is resources and any large company should be doing this as well it's holding on to what you've got okay so employee resource is one of the issues that we're coming across now isn't it so it was the same case there uh, post disaster there from the earthquake looking for opportunities accepting risk and creating new customer value those were the, the four areas and the interesting thing to note here is the first three resource opportunity and accepting risk are are entrepreneurial so that's interesting that, that those are the elements that came out not any of the others and of course creating new customer value is customer focused so it's interesting to see what they needed to do so if we go on to the next slide please this is what i would argue pandemics impact negatively on resilience of ecosystems so government planning can either support or constrain resilience depending on which country you're in so Situational factors impact on a country or region's ecosystem. Okay, so the, the situation the country's in impacts on that system, doesn't it, in multiple ways. To different degrees, ecosystems are impacted during and post pandemic, but the severity of the impact can have an immediacy, much like disasters. That's what I think. And, and some of the early research coming out of the University of Birmingham is that it's a very steep drop, very steep curve and recovery curve going to happen with it from an economic perspective, which would be much like disaster, rather than a crisis, which I kind of implies it's something that's rather more gentle. Um, so I would argue that perhaps we need something that relates clo more closely to disaster planning rather than just crisis. Next slide, please. This is especially for you. I enjoyed making my model. This is applied to larger companies. And it's in the context of, of the uh, COVID-19 pandemic. 
obviously I haven't gone out now to do interviews, but I think this will certainly progress me to doing that. Just a side note, I had a contact from a consultant in uh, America dealing with micro companies and he's using the model, the Morris and Jones model. He couldn't find anything else that would help with the micro companies that don't have support. So he's using that framework and it's working well. He emailed me to tell me, which is delightful to know it's useful to produce something that people can actually use in business. Anyhow, so we go back to this model. So you can see on the left, we have the post-disaster environment ecosystem model. We have um, the, the, the framework there. Um, the situation is on the left. So your company that you're looking at will be in that environment. And within that, that would be worthy of research to find out what's happening. So I focus this really on the larger, wider e ecosystem. As I say, so think about the company you're in or you've worked in and think about the impact that that's potentially having on your ecosystem. So for most of you, you'll be in Singapore and think about, and you'll know from SARS as well, the impact of, of the sort of effects of that ecosystem and what's within that. Now, as a definition, there are several definitions of ecosystem. So it's worthy of deciding which aspects you'd be looking at. But in terms of it could be economic impact, social impact. Uh, access to resources, couldn't it? It could be um, uh, channel partnerships, all sorts of aspects that you could look at. Um, the next um, box, if you like, strategic decision making. So um, decision to resume by the company, by the CEO and the, and the directors, to retract, being more cautious. And we've seen that in the UK with perhaps, our, with, I can think of the auto industry uh maybe perhaps even getting out or delaying so those that resume these are the sorts of things that i think that you'll be the company and this will be reconfiguring uh, resilient supply chains and channels to market that's been a huge issue and you'll see in the uk we haven't been terribly good at that with the ppe but for other uh, other um, avenues looking at agriculture that's a, a real issue for the quantum hub the issue is innovation. Uh, they're impacted, their innovation is impacted, um, their productivity because of this. So reconfiguring, redesigning so that we can su succeed in the future and recover and maintain those supply chains and channels. So they may, they may be um, changed in some way and altered, made more robust, more resilient. Compliance with employees' safety is a huge aspect that we need to think about. And also financial support packages. And I know that in the UK and in Singapore and New Zealand, we're lucky. I think there are many other countries where this is going to be extremely difficult. Um, and interestingly, new and adapted business models. And we can see that, that occurring. I think there are very few businesses who, who shouldn't be thinking about this at the moment. And there may be other, other things in this list that you can think of. Um, so then we look at... Um, the areas that we used on that were prevalent in the disaster recovery and we can see in terms of resources there's a real effort there isn't there employees go off or can't be in buildings so how do you continue a business how do you do that with government regulation or um, and limits um well one of the things you can do to move forward is to accept risk so companies that are very entrepreneurial large or small are very good at um, seeking uh, risk, calculated risk. But in this case, it's different. It's accepting and being aware and having full knowledge of uh, what the company is facing. And that's really important, having open discussions about that to be able to move forward. I think it's very dangerous if we, if we ignore, tend to ignore things and make decisions without the full information. Um, Opportunity seeking behavior. We know there are winners and losers post pandemic or during the pandemic. And I'd like you to just see in a minute the link that Cherry's going to show us. Yeah. So if you just scroll up a bit. Uh, so this is an example of opportunity seeking. I tried to find a Singapore one, but I know there won't be very many wineries in actually in Singapore. But Many companies that have been making uh, wine or making whiskey, we have a Welsh whiskey called Penderyn, and that's flipped over, flipped over to a different production line, making using the same equipment, so making sanitizers, hand sanitizers, 
which we have a huge shortage of. So this is a really interesting um, example. So if we can flip back, please. And what's nice about that, that's very altruistic behaviour, isn't it, as well? So it's always good for the company and its stakeholders. So you can see that leads nice bottom, the bottom part of the model, creating and stakeholder value. And you can see that in that example. Okay. Can we flip to the next slide? These are my references. So if you're coming to join us, you need to do things like this, Harvard referencing, and um, they're useful if you want to have a look at them. Uh, can we flip to the next slide, please? Yeah, this is my view when, when it's graduation day, which is fantastic. Um, getting to know the students very well and then being there at the graduation is, is, is lovely. So um, this is the sector that they carry on up, up to the front and uh, to the organ music and um, the, the university is all about stimulating this global teaching and research and hopefully it's reflected in what I've been showing you today. And the next slide please. There we go. So do please link with me if you want to on LinkedIn and Twitter and there's my email if you have any questions or just want to chat r.jones.4. So there's obviously four of us, at least in Birmingham. It's not a very personalised email, is it? So I do hope that you've enjoyed it. And um, we now move over to, um, looking at the time, we better move over to the actual um, details of any courses that we're offering. Okay. So I'm going to talk you through some of the programmes that we're offering at SIM. Here we go. So this is the campus, and I hope that you, you want to come and see us as well. Founded in 1900, so we, we are very, very um, highly reputable. Um, this, this international reputation is on some major research areas, including medical sciences. Um, oh, thank you, Grace. There you are. You've got an A already for that. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, it's 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 a lovely campus. It's it's outside Birmingham city centre, but it's it's a large. We call it the Green Heart, large grounds. So you often see students hanging out if you like, and there's lots of restaurants and bars. It's a really good feel. And I've worked there since uh, 2013, and it's a delight. People, the people are a delight in the business school. The students are a delight, and um, and also in SIM. I actually started working in SIM um, before I went to Birmingham, and that's the reason why I went to Birmingham is because I enjoyed coming to Sam so much. So one of the largest, uh, most influential uh, universities, uh, Birmingham is at the heart of the Industrial Revolution as well. So it's one of the first places where, where industry started. Uh, yes, we've got a lot of Nobel Prize winners. I haven't heard about mine yet. I hope it's in the post. Um, but yes, we, we have uh, very, very good connections in the business school particularly. So that's probably on the next slide. Yeah, so we're very proud to say that we're triple crown. So there's a, only a small number of universities have this. And also TEF, Teaching Excellence Framework, came in a couple of years ago. And this is very, very hard to achieve. So not all Russell Group universities have this. It's not an automatic process that you have. Uh, and this ensures that your teaching quality is there. Okay, and we, and we have regular accreditation meetings. Those are things that I, I look at and respond to in my role. And I'm not only the MBA director of SIM, I'm also the, the director of all the MBA programmes and we have several of those, okay? And just to explain that we have a one MBA, so there is some flexibility there for you to have new opportunities to study in the UK and also online. Great, so we're also a member of the Universitas 21 Global Network and of course one of the prestigious Russell Group universities, so your degree will be of greater value than other degrees by employers. Next one, please. Okay, here we are. These things are amazing. We, we keep long-term long contact with our students um, on our programmes. Um, this is because they'll keep asking our students. So we're only as good as what our previous students thought of us. So this is what these are based on. So 81st in the world for QS World University Rankings. We're actually just 
become the 17th. We've entered the first time for di our digital, our digital learning MBA, and that's 17th um, for the QS rankings this year as well. I don't think there's a huge number on there, but we've been doing that for four years. So we're very experienced in, in that side. And that's been very useful during this period that we have much more experience than a lot of universities in digital learning as well. So top 16 universities in the UK, and we have an awful lot of universities in the UK. The Guardian is, is one of our typically education based newspapers. 13th university in the UK, so the complete university guide and 14th in the UK. The Times is our national broadsheet. Times good university guides and we always constantly want to achieve that but generally care of our students more than anything else and if you if you treat everybody in the right way and we do things have things in place in the first place this happens uh, naturally okay next slide please Jerry okay this is old Tom I'm missing old Tom I haven't seen old Tom because we're in lockdown but uh, he's he's usually bonging away and I'm running to a lecture. Um, but the business school has been a major player. It started off very, very early on working with companies. So it has a lot of blue chip links. We have a very, very, very um, just alumni network. And I know that you do in, in Singapore too, with SIM. And what happens is when we have Part of the accreditation process is that we invite these alumni to meet you. So, for example, just recently, I was down in London and we went into officials' war rooms and we went to Google and we went to all companies with the students. But at the end of the evening, we went to Churchill's war rooms where I got to do a speech with the alumni and the, and the students that we have in Birmingham and also some of the distance learning students and our exec MBA UK as well. So that was delightful and they're great people that you can connect with and work, work with. So um, we offer many programs in business and we have all representations of all businesses, which not all schools have. Not all top business schools have other, other at such a senior level, for example, medical science. Um, and this very strong industry employer relationship, which helps. And we have a very strong advisory board in the business school, which helps us as well. Um, so you'll see, take a look at our website and there is a lot going on about our debates at the moment. Awful lot going on about COVID and the work that we're doing in research, uh, which is groundbreaking. Um, and the hospital is right next to it actually. And so the university is hosting the nurses in our, in our hotels, which is fantastic. So our research is going on. Um, so the next page, please. So we have the Master of Business Administration. I'll have to minim minimise my thing, I can't see that. Hang on a minute. Business Administration, which is part-time. We have the Master of Science International Business, which is full-time. We have the Master of Science Management full-time. And then we have different pathways. So we have entrepreneurship and innovation, organisational leadership and change, or strategy. Okay. Next slide, Jerry. So we'll talk about the MBA programme first. And this is part-time, okay? So you can complete it in two years, or you have up to a maximum of four years. Good, so I completed mine in two and a half years. But I had a very, very full-time, busy job, so, so it's good to have that flexibility. Um, fully taught by Birmingham faculty, so this is important. So, so what you have in the UK, you get exactly, if not better, in SIM, to be honest, with administrative assistants. And I have to say that SIM are fantastic in their organisation. And in Birmingham, we have a great MBA team. They're very small and they're very knowledgeable and we know each other very well and they know the students very well. So the smooth running of the administ administrative processes is, is, is really excellent. So what you need to know is this, isn't it? What's it going to look like? So delivered intensively over a week. So Monday to Friday, 7 p.m. to 10.15, and then a Saturday and a Sunday. Okay, so you have one, model, one module delivered every two months. So that's not too onerous, okay? So I touched upon the one MBA before. This is something that most, most if very few universities offer. So, 
we have slight differences in the program so there are more opportunities for students if they're looking at a module from one of the other programs that we run but generally it's the same okay so certainly your core modules are going to be the same and most of your electives but it does mean that you can come and study um, outside of Singapore our students from the UK can come to Singapore um, so there's a, a lot of opportunity there and flexibility which I think is very important and here you can see some of the pictures here which looks like it's oh yeah that's in Birmingham and then we've got some get-togethers here alumni dinner in, in Birmingham okay so we can make majors sort of people here in the middle there you can see Kathy Cassell who's our Dean who's absolutely marvellous and to the right you can see uh, Derek who I'm taking over from Derek Condon who's still in this role as I take over uh, yeah so it's just a happy time just a great time um, on, please uh, these are the, the that we have for students that actually come on to the MBA average over 30 it's good to have that experience and we're looking for that before you go on to an MBA so they have significant sort of experience in, in managing people um, so these are the breakdowns that you can see here it's interesting to note that uh, manufacturing is quite a key sector that's fine we can all see that that's fine but if you're in a different one don't panic you don't necessarily have to be in that category let's have a little look at the next slide okay so these are some of the participants in the alumni profile and we'll click on to the next And we'll look at the Master of Science IB and the management uh, pathways here. Next slide, please. Okay, so it starts in October, it's one year full time, 100% attendance. And here we are, one or two modules delivered monthly. So every module is delivered in a week. Okay, so your lecture period is October to May. Okay, that's fine. On with the next one, Sherry. Okay, these are the programmes that we covered before. Have a look at that and think, think what you'd be interested in looking at. I'm not going to read through it all because I think you can, you can see there, which would be appropriate to you. But I imagine that whilst you're on there, you'll be able to make a decision or discuss that in more depth before you decide. Next slide, please. I think this is one of the most important things. So we offer the programmes and you can see that we're excellent at that. But one of the things we're also excellent at is wraparound support. So student pedagogy. And you can see this relates to the um, Masters Management, MSc Management and also MSc IB. Uh, you'll be talking uh, with your programme director and pre and post module Canvas chat, mock interviews, uh, career events and workshops and dinners and critical reflecting and writing and then you'll have a supervisor that will be assigned to you that has is a specialist in your area to guide you with your student dissertation okay next slide please oh. so we have a career event workshop that gives you lots of support learning about entrepreneurship and innovation okay being able to communicate more effectively work in team all this is really really important and you can see lots of the events that you're doing there are quite fun and lots of uh, dinners as well and that's ones at mount faber next please and this gives you an idea for the msc ib uh, the cohort of students that you see i don't know who that is at the back but they look like they're having fun um, and you can see the representations you have there. So it really is global, and this gives you a really good global network to, to work with. This is the current academic, academic year. Next slide, please. And here are the specialist pathways for MSc management. Also this year, like a happy bunch, don't they? So China, Hong Kong, India, Indonesia, quite a lot from Asia. So degrees this is really worthwhile knowing for you i think that you'll get exactly the same um degree awarded as you would at university of birmingham you need to complete 12 modules and a dissertation and it's worth mentioning 
um, that we do have extenuating circumstances. I was at a panel yesterday, so so we do have flexibility if, if an issue comes up, which it often does with students. And I sit on that panel in the UK, uh, also for the Singapore students. So so you sort of looked after uh, very very much by both teams and ourselves. When you graduate, you have a University of Birmingham degree, and that's a copy of it there. Okay. Next slide. This gives you some of the statistics here for the MBA. Graduated with merit and distinction, so that's good. 77% is very good for the MBA. 65 for the IB. MSc Management, 50%. MSc Management Strategy, 75%. MSc Management Entrepreneurship and Innovation, 100% merit and distinction. So the students have done very well. And the chap there holding up his phone on the, on the left, he's Richard Black, he's from college. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, so these are the admissions criteria. Now, again, if you need to, um, if you have any particular individual questions about this, it's good to ask the team, either here or, or, or afterwards. We all have your contact details because everybody is very different, of course. Okay, so a good degree. If you're interested in any more, there are the contact details. And I would suggest that you speak to home or Catherine about that. Okay, 